just a minute early just to let people hop on kind of I don't remember how much is known before it starts. <laughs> oh, good morning, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. And just give me the one minute to get everything started and to see when people hop on. So, thank you for your patience. All right, there it is. Okay, well, I hope you guys are having a nice morning to your Saturday. The weather's been nice so far, even though it rained like crazy yesterday, day before, so that should be fun. Um, so we're just going to give it a second, right, and if you guys, I know we're like not quite there yet, but I know migration is coming up soon, so if you've seen any really fun birds in your yard, feel free to comment because that's always a fun time for it. I know people have seen some tanagers and some orioles this winter, so love to hear what's going on with you guys. All right, and I see that people are hopping on, and it's also 8.30, so good morning. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just jump right into it and we'll see kind of what shows up as well too. So um, good morning everyone. Thanks so much for joining me today. My name is Jolene. I'm a certified songbird feeding specialist with Wild Birds Unlimited of Concord. And today we'll be talking about killdeer, which I will be honest, this presentation is a little self-indulgent since I love these little birds and they're not always seen obviously at the feeders, but they can be found pretty locally depending on if you know where to look. So um, we're gonna go ahead and just jump right into it. So if you guys have any questions, definitely feel free to leave a comment and I will be watching there as well too. So for killdeer, they, if you guys have dealt with any other previous presentations, usually we stick with the order Passeriformes, which includes all of our perching songbirds. In this case, we're actually jumping all the way over to order Charadriaformes, which includes all of our shorebirds, gulls, terns, and auks, which of course, a lot of these birds are more coastal birds. And that's what makes the killdeer so interesting is because it's found um, in a lot more drier locations throughout, the, uh, throughout North America as well. More specifically, uh, killdeer are in the plover family, Charadriidae, so it's plovers and lapwings as well too. So as we can see by the map here, they actually do have a very wide range and their habitat varies greatly depending on the time of year. So they can um, inhabit more wetter habitats, of course, like coastal areas, sandbars, or mudflats, but they also take advantage of pastures, like cow pastures, they'll take advantage of golf courses, athletic fields, airports, and an even crazier, when they're nesting, they'll take advantage of asphalt locations and um, those kinds of, what is the word? Parking lots, that's the word, <laughs> and gravel rooftops as well, too. So these guys have a varied, um, habitat range as well. So you can see them in a lot of different locations. So the purple range is where they are year round. When this, when the temperatures start to warm up in cooler locations, they push their range all the way up to Northern Canada. And you can see that they have their summer range in some of the Appalachian mountains as well too. So we have killdeer both in the summertime and the um, year round as well, depending on location. And then the blue range in Central and South America is their wintering habitat. So when things are not as hot <laughs> in, um, very warm places as well. So on the record, in uh, banding records, the oldest killdeer to date was 10 years and 11 months old. So when it comes to plovers, they do have a very distinct shape. Um, they often have a very kind of large round head with a large eye and a very uniform kind of short bill. For plovers in general, their bill length does not exceed if you flip the bill on, on the on the head of the bird itself, so bear with me. Uh, it does not exceed the length of the base of the bill to the back of the eye. So the length of the bill is never gonna get any longer than that. So that kind of sets it apart from like sand, sandpipers or any other shorebirds as well. These birds are also super lanky. They have longer legs, which allows them to easily uh, walk around wetter habitats or coastal habitats. And they have long wings and pointed tails, which are seen very distinctly in flight. In regards to color, it kind of looks very similar to some other plover species. So they have um, brown and tan feathers on the top and a white belly and breast as well too. Something that sets the killdeer apart from other plover species that look pretty similar is the fact that they have two black bands. So one around the neck and then one right below it on the breast as well too. The adults do have an orange buff rump atop the tail. The males usually have a darker um, orange buff coloration while the females have a lighter, but it's very indistinct and it's hard to kind of um, figure out without like obvious comparison as well too. 
Now, the name of the killdeer actually comes from the call, and it's a two-note call, and it sounds something like a killdeer, killdeer kind of deal. But we're going to go ahead and just let the bird do the job. Hopefully, this isn't too loud. I'm trying to keep track of that as well, too. So it's essentially just a two-note kind of deal. So hopefully you guys hear that okay. But it can often be pretty rapid in flight as well. So these birds will call um, on the ground or in flight too. So hopefully you guys heard that all right. Uh, but that is actually where the killdeer got its namesake. Uh, nothing else really different there, but it's always fun to see what onomatopoeias people come up with for bird calls in general. So here's an example of some other plover species. Again, a lot of plovers are going to be in more coastal areas or wetter habitats, so we're not really going to see them in the Piedmont area unless it's during migration. But it's just a good idea to know what other members of the family look like. So you're going to notice they have those shorter bills. Um, some of the other ones do have that kind of black band around the neck, and of course that killdeer still just has two of those bands, which makes that very distinct. But they have those longer legs to help them maneuver those wetter habitats as well. So some other things I want to note about these birds is that, so as we've talked about before, songbirds in the uh, Passeriformes order have a, um, oh my goodness, a, oh my God, there's a word, to toe, foot orientation, that's the word, that's the word, we're getting there, where basically they have three toes in the front and one toe in the back, and this allows them to easily grip onto um, branches and things like that, hence the name perching songbirds. Well, Killdeer and other plovers actually have a very small hind toe. It's very vestigial. So it's there, but it doesn't do anything. So you will not find these birds perching or roosting in the trees unless like they really want to and it's a very large branch, uh, but they don't have the ability to do that. So most of the time, these guys are going to be found on the ground or in the air. These birds are ground foragers and also pretty good swimmers despite everything. And they have longer wings, kind of like as we saw. So you can see how they're more of that pointed shape and that pointed tail. Um, and they have rapid, quick maneuvers due to the shape of their wing. They do call a lot when flying, so if you hear that call and it's pretty rapid, you can always look up and chances are the killdeer that way. Um, and here you can get a better look at that orange buff rump as well too. Now these birds are pretty tolerant to human spaces, kind of as we've talked about, they will take advantage of um, athletic fields or golf courses. They've been known to trail behind um, farmers and their plows looking for food that that plow like kind of pulls up as well too so they'll take advantage of those locations compared to other species and they do have a tendency to kind of work around in small flocks in winter and migration so they can do a mix of killdeer um, killdeer flocks or mix in with other sh shorebird species as well so the diet that these birds have it focuses heavily on invertebrates so things like earthworms snails and various insects uh, they often forage in areas with very little ground cover, so it's going to be more open because these birds have large eyes and they need that for um, good visibility to see any prey that they're going for. I will say they do kind of um, forage in a way similar to if you've ever seen a robin kind of forage, is they will essentially run quickly, stop, wait, run again, stop, grab some food on the way, run, and they'll kind of repeat that behavior, which kind of looks something like this once I find the right path. There we go. So this is a juvenile killdeer. But basically, you can see those long legs in action. It basically keeps um, having no feathers there, makes it easier to keep themselves dry. But basically, they'll kind of stop, run, wait, and then gr uh, grab any food on the way as well, too. So it's a very interesting, fun kind of behavior to watch. Um, one thing I do want to point out, because I like, I don't know too much about like the different species of shorebirds, but I know like general stuff somewhat. Uh, one thing I want to point out is you've got a different species of, um, not quite that. You've got two different beak types and different feeding strategies in this video. So we just talked about the killdeer and how they kind of like pick up along the way. But I do want to focus a little bit on this guy in the back with a longer beak who's doing a probing strategy. So he will kind of put his head in the water repeatedly and kind of forage for any, um, any food items kind of on the ground there as well too. So just fun thing to point out with different beaks, you have different feeding strategies there as well too. Another strategy that killdeer will sometimes use, especially in like wetter habitats, is that if it's pretty still water or anything, they'll actually kind of take their foot and kind of like pat it or vibrate it on the ground. And what that'll do is agitate the material to expose any potential prey so that the killdeer can go for that as well too. 
And these birds can be surprisingly active both at day and night because again, when they're so used to human habitats, they'll take advantage of parking lots or lit ball fields that just have good visibility and allow them to forage at night as well too. And these birds often have their foraging spots and roosting spots pretty close together. So you can find killdeer in the same general area at day or night. When it comes to courtship and nesting season, it's actually this time of year for the southern U.S. as well too, which is like March, April kind of season, which is why I thought now is a good time to talk about it. These birds can be monogamous for multiple seasons, so they'll stick with the same partner for um, multiple nesting seasons. And something that is interesting about their courtship style is that it focuses heavily on their nesting site. So they do something uh, that's called a scrape ceremony because these birds are ground nesters. What will happen is the male will initiate by basically scraping to form a shallow depression in the ground. Once he's done so and the female is interested in checking things out, she'll kind of push the male from that space and kind of take over that scrape. While the male will stand nearby, he'll start calling and sometimes he'll toss material over his shoulder as well too. They'll kind of continue this behavior and switch back and forth as needed until they're satisfied with kind of the ceremony and the nesting site as well too. So it's just a fun behavior. If you ever get the chance to see that, it's pretty cool. Um, when they have kind of established that nesting site, they do prefer an area that's slightly elevated compared to the surrounding area, which helps avoid any flooding. Um, good morning. And gives a better view of any nearby predators because these guys prefer a more open nesting site. So that does leave them very exposed to various predators as well too. And the nesting site is usually what's interesting because these birds will take advantage of gravel road shoulders, parking lots, open fields, pastures, your driveway. So it can be pretty problematic if you're not ready for some of these birds, uh, but they take advantage of wherever looks best. Occasionally they can uh, work with flat gravel rooftops, which can be hazardous to them if they don't have a good way to get the young down, but it does occasionally happen. Despite being kind of more of a simple ground nest, it takes anywhere from seven to 10 days to build the nest. These birds prefer a lighter colored material for the nest, such as lighter rocks, pebbles, or lighter grasses as well too. And they do have a tendency to create false nests. Um, so you can have some areas that they set up and then just chose to pick somewhere else to nest as well too. Uh, when they finally set up the nest, they can have anywhere from one to three broods. Usually they just have one brood and that's kind of the focus for the season, but depending on if something happens to that first brood or they've started really early, they can have a second or a third depending on what's going on. They average around four eggs. And I just want to point out how well camouflaged these eggs are. Like, of course, as we're close up, we can kind of see where they are. But if you were looking from the, um, from a far away distance, you would not be able to notice that. And somebody said they put a landscaping flag nearby when they nest in their yard. That is great. That is exactly what you want to do. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, but yeah, they can be, they can pick some surprising locations <laughs> when you're not ready for it, for sure. Um, compared to a lot of songbird eggs, these eggs are a little bit more pointed. So a lot of the times the pointed end is, all of the pointed ends of the eggs are faced together in the center, um, which basically reduces the surface area needed to incubate the eggs. So they're kept, um, so it's just easier for the parent to incubate them. And so, yeah, essentially that. <laughs> Sometimes the words aren't there and they never are. Um, once all the eggs are laid, the incubation period can take anywhere from 22 to 28 days. So a little less than a month. And both parents will incubate the egg. So the um, male and the female will switch off to kind of work together. And if the temperatures ever get too hot, these birds, because again, it's open and exposed, um, they will actually just stand over the eggs to provide shade um, as they are kind of incubating. Now, this is the time of year that killdeer are most well known for and probably have some of the more interesting behaviors compared to some other birds. Like I mentioned, these birds have a nest in a very open habitat that is easily exposed to predators. So of course, killdeer have adapted some displays to kind of keep those predators from finding the nest or from eating the eggs. First off is false brooding. So if they notice a predator in the area, the killdeer um, that is incubating will actually get up, walk away, and um, pick a different nest 
which is there's nothing underneath there, to incubate or to brood on to confuse the predator as to where the actual nesting site is. Um, so that is one option that they might use. The other is an injury display or the broken wing display. So this occurs when a kill deer will actually leave the nest. They'll kind of crouch, they'll hang their head low, their wings are extended and their tail is fanned or dragging. The body faces away from the predator, but the kill deer continues to maintain eye contact. So that looks something like this. So these birds will lay there, they'll pretend to have an injury so that they can't move, and basically you'll know it's different because they kind of keep watching the predator and they're saying, oh no, I'm defenseless. I'm totally able to be eaten at this, you know, these injuries and everything. Um, so what happens is when the kill deer is far enough away from the nest, they employ this strategy, which distracts the predator so that the predator hopefully goes towards the kill deer adult. And once they've successfully distracted that predator far enough, the kill deer will get up and fly away because he's actually completely fine. Um, but they will definitely put on a very convincing display to show that they are um, injured and vulnerable. And that is one where you kind of see they give up halfway through. And then this one is a shorter one, but uh, just be ready. Essentially, they're making it look like they're injured. They feel like they've done their job. And then they'll just fly right off because they're totally fine. And it does what it, they needed to do as well. So really, really interesting behaviors, um, and they're definitely very dedicated actors as well. Uh, the last display that they sometimes use is called an ungulate display. Ungulates are hooved mammals, so think of cows, because these birds do also commonly nest in cow pastures. Um, so when you have something like a cow, they're not necessarily like there to eat the eggs, but they're very large and can easily step on the nest if they aren't paying attention. So what will happen is the kill deer will remain motionless on the nest until the predator approaches, and then they'll rush forward and scream um, to get the predator's attention to kind of spook and go a different direction. So this is an example somewhat of that kind of display. Um, let's see, I don't know, because I know they talk a little bit in this one. But essentially, as a predator or a threat gets closer to larger mammals that aren't paying attention, um, they'll rush forward and do a lot of calling. So um, this is kind of a very subtle version oh, yeah. of that display. And you can see like the nest is right there, so they're going to stay nearby. Uh, but essentially, they're just kind of trying to make noise so that they're known, so that the... Um, threat can kind of avoid the nesting site as well. So really cool displays. Obviously we don't want to stress the birds out and make those happen, but it is interesting to see them when they occur. So once they have successfully um, defended the eggs and incubated them for the, the amount of time needed, the nesting period for these killdeer is actually just one day. So if we think about our songbirds, so bluebirds for example, they take about two weeks to incubate the eggs and then two weeks to um, that nestling phase where the young develop all their feathers, their eyes start to open, they're able to kind of eat on their own and everything, and then they eventually fledge, right? So those are called altricial young. Killdeer and other types of shorebirds or just kind of some other birds in general have a different strategy where they have precocial young because again, that nesting site isn't necessarily safe to stay at in one period for a long duration of time. So these young, when they hatch, their eyes are open, they're covered in downy feathers, they're able to walk and feed on their own, uh, which allows them to have better survival rates as well too, at least at that point. So you can see that these birds have very downy feathers and they're also still kind of well camouflaged as well too, which is nice. So um, they're definitely subtle in that coloration. But essentially when um, they start to hatch, they'll remain at the nest until all of the chicks are hatched and dry, which again, just takes like a day and then off they go. They'll follow the parents for quite a while and the parents will show them like uh, foraging sites to go to and what sites are best. And they will continue to travel with the parents until they're around 39 days old, in which case they'll kind of deviate or they'll split up into like those kind of migration or wintering flocks um, until the next nesting season where they kind of make their own choices as well. Um, one thing about the chicks that I will mention too is that they have only one black band compared to the two bands for the other kill deer and they also lack that rufous color on the rump. So you can see a good picture of them here. They have very fuzzy feathers and they're much smaller than the adults. And they only have the one band in comparison to the two, just to kind of make that easier. So 
a conservation way. The, these guys have uh, their numbers and population are still very good, but because of the way that they nest and the locations that they nest in, they can be pretty vulnerable to a variety of different things. Lawnmowers and automobiles are big ones because they'll pick interesting choices <laughs> to nest in, whether again that is a driveway or the side of an asphalt road, um, or if it's a cow pasture or just your yard, lawnmowers can also be an issue there this time of year. Um, Pesticides in general, this is just for birds in general, because pesticides, of course, affect the insects and things in our yard, which are a very big aspect of a bird's diet, especially during nesting season or year round. So those can cause negative effects to the songbirds in our area or just birds in general in our area as well, too. Uh, so one thing I did want to point out that somebody mentioned, uh, Monica mentioned as well, too, is if you find a nest, what do you kind of do? Um, and again, this doesn't have it depends on location and where you're at. Um, and sometimes these nests are in inconvenient locations. Uh, so basically when you do find a nest, you do not want to disturb it. You do want to leave it where it's at. And you can put kind of soft barriers around it, if at all possible, to help um, give you an idea of where to avoid and kind of go around it so that they can continue nesting. It does take, like we said, about 22 to 28 days. So it is a little inconvenient for that time. But once that period is done, those birds are out and that area is, um, safe for you to utilize again as well too. So as best you can, definitely feel free to put soft barriers around it um, just so you can avoid that location in general as well. So with that being said, that's kind of all I have to say about the killdeer. Again, this is pretty self-indulgent because I love them and it's one of those uh, plover species that we can actually see here either year round or in the summertime too. So if you're going to your local park or ball field or anything like that, keep an eye out because you never know when you'll see these birds around. Um, if you want to, um, depending on where you're at and if you plan on shopping today, I do have a coupon for, oh my gosh, coupon code for you of $5 off a $25 purchase of, or more. The coupon code is KILLDEER. Uh, it's only available today either in store or through a phone order as well too. And then there will be a second presentation of this in store at 11 a.m. in case you know anybody nearby that would like to check this out as well too. Uh, these are all the resources that I used. Once again, Macaulay Library is where anybody can update their own pictures or videos and that is what allows me to kind of help provide you guys with a lot of really cool resources and information and just kind of uh, good stuff there as well too. And All About Birds is a great resource to kind of check out more about birds in your area or birds that you may have never heard of either. So feel free to kind of check those out as well too. Thank you guys again so much for joining me today. I hope you guys have a very good weekend and that the weather stays nice. Who knows what it's going to do. Um, next month, we're possibly going to try something different. So keep an eye out um, on our Facebook page or for emails to see what will be happening in April, depending on how all that goes. But um, thank you guys so much for your time and I will see you next time. Bye.